for a $65 shoe technology that was groundbreaking. And the first year we sold 14 million pairs mm-hmm. of those damn DMX walking shoes. It was crazy. <laughs> 550s, 574, nine, the 900 series coming on strong still. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm competing against my 22-year-old self. I mean, it's crazy That's in dope. my 50s. That's you know? And we flipped open that box and I pressed that button and his eyes got like that big. He's mm-hmm. like holy crap, you guys did it. This is what we need. We can never do that. We're like, why? Well, here it is. I just did it. I can't drag myself down to somebody else's level of mediocrity. I give it my all. Whether they want it or not, they're getting it. Because right. that's why that's why they hired me. That's why I love working with Ye. It's this, we're, we're cut from the same cloth. We, we ride together. We're the yin and the yang for each other. People look, looked at us as like the Tinker and Jordan of today. But there's definitely a vibe and a flavor and a DNA to it that you immediately see it. And like, that's a Yeezy. We're here with another legendary episode, and I always like to have everybody introduce themselves. I'll let you introduce yourself to the world, how you would like to be seen, and then we'll go ahead and start breaking down the stories and history of your career. I'm Stephen Smith, and uh, I've been called the godfather of dad shoes because of my early work at New Balance, uh, which I think is pretty funny (laughs) um, because I was a straight-edge 22-year-old punk at that point designing what would become these uh, definitive dad shoes, and... um, Made a lot of uh, made a lot of big products for the industry between Reebok and Nike and Yeezy and uh, Adidas and uh, a couple here and there at, at Fila and um, yeah, it's all good fun. So I have a list on my phone. Correct me if I'm wrong or if I need to tap into a couple other things as well right here. So we got the New Balance five seven four nine nine six. 997, 1500. Yeah. Five, Those are all your designs? 550, 550. 650, 576, 577, uh, 428, 429. There's a bunch more that I forgot. I mean, it's been 38 <laughs> years. so. <laughs> right, right. Okay. And then uh, the Adidas Artillery? Yeah, Artillery, Phantom 2, the Reload. Uh, Lots of lots of styles there. Okay. Bauer series, ATP tennis series, uh, lot lots of stuff. And then Insta Fury Pump, DMX technology, Pretty new much. logo with the uh, Reebok. Yeah, the the vec the updated vector. And then uh, pretty much any technology that came out of Reebok came out of the team that I worked on with my two development partners, Paul Hitchfield and Peter Foley. We were kind of the core of the innovation team. So pretty much any any technology Reebok had came out of the three of us. And then Grant Hill, what Fila's? Yeah, I did a Grant Hill at Fila. I worked directly with Grant Hill. And then in the end, they didn't uh, they didn't use that one. And then it was kind of funny about... Four years ago, out of the blue, they decided to reissue the unissued Grant Hill. So it was, gotcha. it was kind of wild to see it show up. They got <laughs> the what... proportions kind of wonky, but it was uh, it was cool to see it uh, finally come to market. That's dope. And then the Skepta, um, the Airstreaks, Spectrum Plus, and then a lot of the Yeezy stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I, I did a ton of stuff at Nike, performance running, um, kids, girls toddlers um package design track spikes monster fly sean crawford got the gold medal and the silver medal at the olympics and the Dope. monster fly which was pretty epic because uh, everybody else was scared of it and then it was funny of all the shoes that nike has in their archive and what they could have used it was kind of cool to see Stussy picked the Cage Zoom Spirit on that I did, and the, mainly for Japan. And then also the when Supreme picked a shoe, they picked the Spectrum with the Flames, which mm. was another really cool one. And that was that was also done originally for Nike Japan. Um, so anyway, I like to joke about that one because you know that those those two came out while we were at our peak at Yeezy and. Uh, Steven's so hot right now, like Zoolander, that <laughs> of everybody else's designs they could have picked, they picked mine. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so before we get too deep into all the designs and everything like that, I always like to take it back. I need you to paint that picture for me. Give me the era. Give me the lifestyle. Give me the family environment, the home environment. Where, where did you uh, 
learn about kind of was your family teaching you about finances as a young age like where were you guys at financially like all those different things i want you to paint that picture for me that that grade school middle school era you know i i, I grew up in a working class middle class neighborhood you know we we had one of the nicer houses on the street but we were certainly not wealthy by any means mm-hmm. my parents worked their asses off for all of us to go to college because my dad never got to go because his oldest brother used all the college funds by the time it got to him there was no money left mm. so he he made a vow that no matter what happened his kids were going to go to college wherever they wanted to go um and he worked three different jobs for us while my mom was a school teacher so education was important um working hard was important Mm -hmm. financial struggle was important and you know when we were young they would drive us through the the wealthy neighborhoods and show us the houses and say that's the goal that's what you need to work for Mm -hmm. work hard you can have this and so they kind of drove that into my head but also my my grandfather um on my mom's side was a detail finished carpenter. He wanted to be a surgeon, Mm -hmm. uh, but his family had no money. So he went to go be a detail and finished carpenter. So he did house construction, but one of his fortes was uh, delicate work on church altars. Mm. Um, And so those take a long time to do. Yeah. You know, it was that precision that I think I, I learned from him and the woodworking and crafting with my hand. He was from that generation, uh, that believed they could do anything from electrical to wiring to construction. They could build or make anything. And I think he instilled that in me more than anybody Mm -hmm. that anything was possible. You can do it. So I've always uh, had that in the back of my mind, you know, try it. What's the worst that can happen if you don't try it, then you've already failed. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's been one of my, my key beliefs from him. So during this time, Mm -hmm. there wasn't a sneaker head. There wasn't a, that wasn't a thing yet. It was just like, if you like shoes or if you're interested in it, you know, maybe you had a couple pairs, you try to keep them cleaner, or maybe you just love the shoe and you beat it up for, you know, whatever, maybe what was, what was like your kind of situation and scenario? What were the hot shoes that you had your eye on? Or was that even a thing later when you got, you know, older? It was there were no sneaker heads. There was no collecting. You know, I almost got kind of mocked because I, I saved all my old shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my favorites at the time. I mean, I ran high school track. I ran with my older sister in middle school, and so they were they were my. The wants were kind of focused around running. Although I did have early Dr. J's mm-hmm. uh, for some basketball because we had a hoop. You know, my brother and I built a hoop out in the driveway. Okay, so, so was you a baller or what? No, nah, I sucked. <laughs> um, that's why I went into running and okay. kind of more action sports. Be, be early days of BMX. Uh, I had an old split tail banana board skateboard. So that was more my thing. And then motocross, it, the kind of the individual sports. So, um, so yeah, some of my favorite shoes from then, I remember when the... I, I was running in Etonic Street Fighters. Mm-hmm. That was one of my all-time favorite shoes from that period. The shoe, the shoe that I always wanted, was the New Balance Super Comp. Okay. And my parents couldn't afford it, so that was always a desire for me. But at the time, I, I had the first pair of waffles when they came out, the, the blue and yellow. Um, a few Adidas Countries, a really cool Puma shoe called the Power Cat. That one was neat. It was this uh, cylindrical lug pattern repeated in gum rubber. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was a really nice shoe. Um, yeah. Oh, Con- Converse made this running shoe that was pretty nice. I had all three colors, but you know, in those days, uh, you got back to school season was when you got your new shoes. Mm-hmm. So you choose wisely because you got one pair and mm-hmm. you had to make it last. Um, so that's why I, I cherish them and, and took good care of them. But, you know, eventually you wear them out cause you're a kid and you, right. and you destroy them. And I had them all in a box. And then, you know, one day I came home and my mom had thrown, these things stink and they, they were gone. I'm like, no, oh, so all, that's my, crazy. all my favorites get kind of tossed. So uh, what so. was it like buying your first pair of shoes? Do you remember that moment? Like you buying your first pair of shoes? Oh, geez. I think it was the... It might, it was us. Well, I think back, I had a pair of like knockoff 
SL-72s that they sold at Kmart. Okay. Um, and I, I remember buying those because I wanted the SL-72, and I didn't know any better. It was, it was just like them. They're blue with the, the stripes. And mm-hmm. So I ended up with those, and they you know they obviously weren't as good as, as the Adidas ones. So next came the, the Converse's because those were some real... Yeah, you know, like I said, at the time, Converse made this real running shoe. And mm-hmm. Man, I I love those. I I got three different colors of them, um, and then they phased it out, and that's when I moved over to the waffles. The original waffle just had this little strip of suede down the toe, yeah, um, and it didn't have the reinforced heel. It was a single sheet of the of the waffle that was die cut and punched out, and so you wore right through the heel because there was very little lugs there, and then that little suede was not enough to stop your big toe from blowing through the side of the shoe. Uh, and so that I sent those to tread two to get refurbished and they, they came back kind of looking shitty. So I was like, fuck, I got to get something else. So that's when I went to the street fighters cause they had that beautiful suede toe. Okay. And they took a beating. I mean, that was a, that was such a great shoe. The funny thing was it was early days of, uh, bright blue suedes mm-hmm. and for the, it, entire life of those shoes they turned all my socks blue uh the the whatever they used to dye and tan the hide just bled right through everything that is funny okay so you get to now you're kind of like you're understanding just the finance side of like you know i need to work hard to be able to get the things i want why you know the importance of the dollar different things like that you're you definitely know that you're into shoes you know that you need to be able to afford these sneakers if you want to have more, as you said, you were already starting to collect them a little bit without even kind of like realizing it or being serious about it. And uh, what what is it what does it look like transitioning into like the high school era and everything like that? Because now I remember when I was in high school, I was like, I want to play football in the NFL, and I gotta go to college so I can get a I need to get a scholarship so I can go to college so I can go to for free and then I can play football. That was like my biggest thing. And I was like, maybe I'll start my business. But, you know, what was your, like, ambitions in high school? How was that lifestyle? Yeah, it was funny. Like I always say in some of the other other interviews, you grew up Irish in the Boston area. You either are the cops or you run from the cops. <laughs> you know, you end up like Whitey Bulger. Right. Um, so, you know, I was going to be a Massachusetts state cop. So I was always trying to stay fit. I ran track. And mm-hmm. at that point, by high school, my older brother had gotten one of the first pair of 990 New Balances I had ever seen, and it was shocking because you know that was the first shoe at a hundred dollars. Mm. Uh, because I don't know if people know, but the, the numbers originally designated the price points, so like the 990 was 99 bucks, but it you know it worked out to be a hundred, and again, that was groundbreaking. That was the first hundred dollar shoe, gotcha. Um, so all of those, all, all of the original numbers were, were, the, were the price points when they were introduced. I like that, and so I, I ended up getting a pair of 990s. I love them. They, they wore like iron. Um, and that became my go-to shoe with that nice blown rubber mm-hmm. Vibram bottom on it. And so going through high school, I ran track, go to college, uh, went to go look into becoming a state police officer, but it was a half an inch too short. At that time, they had a height requirement. Really? Yeah, so it's like... The other thing I loved was art, drawing, and making things and, and products. I love stuff. And uh, so that seemed like the, the alternate choice. So I, I, I went to art school at Mass College of Art in Boston. Okay. Continuing to run, I ran anywhere from 10 to 13 miles a day. I weighed about 135 pounds. Um, and I continued my running all through college. So then in 86, I graduate from college. And it was kind of a lull in, in the economy, and I really didn't know what I was going to do. My parents didn't know what they were going to do with this kid with the art degree. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a few places that hired an industrial designers at that point, as we were known. Um, a lot of it were, uh, a lot of them were consultancies. I didn't want to work for a consultant. I worked for one while I was in college and I really didn't like it because you're always chasing the next project and the next dollar and the next meal. There was a sense of security and continued resources if you went to go pick the corporate route, but those jobs were few and far between at that point because people didn't think they needed full-time design staff at that mm-hmm. point. It was, it was kind of new. So the, the, one of the kids who was a year ahead of me <clears throat> 
He lived up in Lawrence, where New Balance's R&D office was. Yeah, the city itself has definitely changed quite a bit. Even even Lawrence, where the factory was, is kind of cleaned up. There's some art galleries, and uh, good old 5 South Union Street looked as good as ever last time I was there a year or two ago, um, up at, at New Balance. And so it, it was interesting, as Terry had gone and applied at New Balance because he lived in Lawrence. So that'd be kind of cool. Even mm-hmm. though they had designers, they had at the time when he applied, they, they were hiring their first ever in-house designers. They hired a guy, Kevin Brown, a year before I got there. Then they immediately had a hiring freeze. So Terry got shut down. So he went and started his own design firm called um, The Design House. And he ended up doing mainly packaging and graphics. Okay. So a year later, New Balance lifts the hiring freeze and we're going to go hire the second ever designer they ever had. Okay. And so they call Terry back and he's like, look, dudes, I, I, you know, I started my own friend. I couldn't wait around for a year for you. Come on. Right. And he was like, but I know this kid. He's, he just graduated. He loves running passionate and all he ever wore were new balances. Mm -hmm. You should, you should hire him. So he sent me the info. I called, got an interview the next day, went up there with my portfolio and it was kind of funny. They are like, can you do blueprint drawings? And so one of the things I did at my internship that I despised was interior design and space planning. So mm-hmm. I, would, I would have to go do these site studies of uh, radio stations and uh, commercial buildings to install these, um, these spaces. And one of them was WLLH in Lowell. It was their radio station. Mm-hmm. I ended up doing like endless blueprint drawings, going like, "God, this is monotonous." You know, I, <laughs> like, I oh do my not God, do this. Uh, I don't want to do this for a living. Right. You know, just this. I mean, the site planning was cool. You'd go measure everything and figure out where everybody's office was going to be. You learned uh, bureaucratic hierarchy and and office size based on your title and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. craziness like that. You know, the president of the radio station. He needed to have the door furthest away from everybody else, but the closest to the door so he could come and go without people seeing him. <laughs> you know, yeah. things like that you had to consider. Right. Uh, so, like, can you do blueprint drawings? And I'm like, can I do blueprint drawings? So I laid out all these floor plans and interior design that I had done. They're like, holy crap, you can, you know. Um, and then they're like, you know, can you do designs? So I laid out all of my product designs and things that I had done through school and my projects. And they're like, wow, you know, it's it's pretty impressive. And they're like, oh, it's it's eleven thirty, uh, kind of the we we got to wrap up the interview because everybody goes running. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, everybody runs at lunch. I'm like, sweet. Like, Can yeah. I go? And they're like, all right, um, you know, we'll we'll get back to you. So I go home, and my mother's like, did you get a job? I said, I don't know. I said the interview seemed to go. It's the first real interview I ever been on. It seemed to go okay. You right. know, they seemed to be interested in me and like my work. And um, the next day, I got a call and a job offer, and uh, so it was pretty. It was pretty cool. It was very rewarding. Um, really, really nice. You know, I love. I loved working at New Balance. It was my first job. My heart was there, and again, it was literally just two of us, me and Brownie, hmm. and um, we just busted out all the designs. And I liked. I liked to run. So, like, why don't you do the running shoes? I'm like, okay, and then. You know, Brownie did uh, some of the basketball shoes and women's aerobics, which was, you know, because of Reebok was mm-hmm. was a hot thing then. And um, but I did help out on the basketball shoes. Brownie would do the the uh, statement model, so he was working on the um, the James Worthy shoe, Worthy Express, and then I would do the mid and the mid the mid price ones. So that's where like the five fifty came in that was a mid-price shoe mm-hmm. uh kind of in that in that zone of existing with the the worthies but i did a lot of the running shoes i did a lot of weird stuff for the uk with a guy by the name of jim crawford because they never seemed to have time for his projects and so i would always like work on his stuff i'm like come on give it to me i'll work on it at lunch or whatever you know? <laughs> okay okay he's like i've been waiting for a year for this fell running shoe and this orienteering shoe and uh indoor court gum rubber bottom stuff so i did all this fun wacky stuff with him Mm -hmm. soccer you know things that new balance wasn't particularly known for in the u.s but they actually had a big market for in in the uk and 
and Ireland. So, you know, being being Boston Irish, I had to help out. Oh, this would be great. It's right. going, going to Ireland, you know, the home country. So I always loved working on stuff for him. Uh, I think it was Paul Tracy was, I'm trying to remember the name of the players that we, we did the shoes for back then. But, um, yeah, it was really cool. I got to do a whole variety of product by mm-hmm. helping out Jim and also do all do all the running shoes, which, you know, was my passion. So I got to do some perf updates on the 995 and then the 996 was kind of the first one I got I got to do the the update to it. So I was like, this is so freaking cool. Right. I'm designing and updating the shoe that I run in. I mean, how cool was that, you know? Like, you're just making it to your perfection for yourself at the yeah, same well, time. And not like... necessarily for yourself, still having the consumer in right, mind, right. but taking into account the things that I learned or the criticisms of it, the things I loved, the things I didn't like right, about right. it. Here was the opportunity to build the, the, you know, the perfect model of what it was. Mm-hmm. So it was cool, and that was kind of the first one I did. And then, you know, later I got to do the 997, which was like a blank slate uh, for that one with a development guy named Steve Burris. And we did a, we did a lot of the big shoes there. And the like the 574 was birth, birth from the um, 576. And then they uh, kind of stripped it down a little bit and, and put on a single color bottom that I had done. And out of it came this this classic design with that I, I stay strap. Mm-hmm. Um, it became the definitive New Balance classic, so it's kind of it's kind of fun seeing that stuff never stop being in the market. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, thirty seven years later, right? Uh, it's never stopped selling. So yeah, I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon either. Like I don't see it as like oh it's gonna it's gonna fizzle out. Like I think it's gonna be here for a long time. I know it's it's cool to think about the stuff that I've done, you know. And, and I'm not a very egotistical person, but it's it's cool to see these designs become timeless and take on a life of their own. And mm-hmm. cu- you know, they'll they'll be in the marketplace long after I'm dead and gone. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I, I've left my mark at so many companies, but those in particular and. New Balance has been very nice to me, um, even though I, you know, after two and a half years, I, I left. Um, so you, so you are just clearly passionate about this, which caused you to, like you said, take on extra projects, do different things, because this is like a salary job. Yeah, I love design. So you know, you're like, like twenty one thousand dollars a year. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was it was great. It was a great entry. Um, you know, and, and I stop and I think about it now and it's like with Yeezy and what I'm doing in the marketplace and with 550s, 574, nine, the 900 series coming on strong still, mm-hmm. I, I'm competing against my 22-year-old self. I mean, it's crazy That's in dope. my 50s. That's dope. You know? I mean, it's it's nuts. I never yeah. thought like, holy shit, these designs will be being sold forever. Right. You know, I was right. just doing the best I could at that moment in time for that particular brand. And it's that mentality that I've had everywhere I've worked where I've never designed the same shoe twice. Mm -hmm. You know, each brand has its own DNA and language to it uh, that gives it what it is, you know. And it's when a company would get lost or go astray where I I was kind of not interested or I would become... I would become the voice of that brand. Like, mm-hmm. this isn't right. Let's do this. You right. know? And then people are like, oh, you're difficult. I'm like, no, I care. Right, right, right. And right. that was one of the problems. A lot of the times at these companies, I cared too much, mm-hmm. more than some of the other people. They were there as, as a bureaucrat or to keep their job. And I was there to, to deliver excellence. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a hard thing to do when you want to do the right thing and you want to deliver excellence and other people are there just to collect a check. That's... But still proves and shows right there. Like again, we're gonna talk about the other things that you've done in your career. But yeah. those things, would you care? Then that's how you get that call from the next brand, the next call from the next brand, and you know now it's like you said, working with Easy, doing those things because of those reasons. And a lot of people, like you said, just come for the check, and yeah. then they're just here to do their thing, and then they don't get to level up or hit the potential that they should have or wanted to or whatever it may be. I know it's like you always want to ask them, do you love? Do you love what you're doing? Right. Or are you just punching the clock you know i mean i was passionate about it and got 
got labeled as difficult because I cared. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, other people didn't care as much. And and to me, it was heartbreaking because you have this expectation of, why don't you care? Aren't you as passionate as I am? Why don't you care? Right. You know, and then at some point, those people feel threatened or they're insecure. And then they figure out how to get rid of you, which is the sad thing because you're like, you're like, you, you want to bring them along with you and go, step up to my level of the game. Come on. Right. You know, we're, we're playing at, at the, this is the, this is the freaking Stanley Cup. This is the playoffs. Step it up. Come on. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Mm-hmm. And it's heartbreaking where they just want to stay as like a, you know, a farm team. So you would say that energy, that emotion, that vibe came from, like you said, parents, grandparents, all those different things. When you got into design, you definitely started to see it when you got into the real workspace. It's like, hey, I'll, this was instilled in me because that's what it sounds like for me from, you know, your past when you were younger. Like, hey, I got to give it all my all on everything I do. I got to treat everything like this. Absolutely. It's all or nothing. And I mean, that's been the rewarding part of connecting with EA because it's the same kind of thing. You know, when we come, we came out with a product, it was like, Everything on Black 38, roll that wheel, put the stack on the table. Mm -hmm. And you can see where it is with that, with the product, where it's disruptive, it's disturbing, Mm -hmm. it's it's divisive, where people like, I don't, I don't know, you know, because we went from like the 350 to the 700 Wave Runner. People like, what is that? You know, that's not another 350. Exactly. It's not another 350. It's the next Yeezy. It's the next phase. It's the future. We're, we're, we're constantly moving into the future. You can't be trapped in the past. So, so. yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, it's funny because like you said, you're talking about that now, even on the Yeezy projects, but this is almost like you've been doing this for every brand you worked with. What were some of the struggles that you would say you ran into uh, when you were at New Balance before you decided to switch? You know, you see how big they are now. At the time, we were $112 million in annual sales, Mm -hmm. which is still mind-blowing. You think of how big they are now, and then you think of how difficult it is to start a brand. I mean, they were maintaining a brand at $112 million. Jim owned his own factories, which I look back at it was pretty incredible when you think about it. Mm-hmm. But they were super thrifty. And I had my development guy, a guy named Dana Judici. He left and went to Adidas. And mm. Adidas at that point was in New Jersey. And, you know, the Run DMC era was a great blip for Adidas. But shortly after that, the kids dropped them. Nobody cared. They were Foot Locker's bitch. Mm. And the business was tanking in the U.S. I mean, it's it's kind of parallel to a little bit of what's happening right now. But <laughs> um, they decided it was a guy, uh, Ron Moore. Mm-hmm. And he was the president of the U.S. They decided they needed to beef it up and and save the brand in the, in the U.S. for Adidas. For Adidas. Okay. So they brought in Dana. Uh, another guy, Dan from Saucony, some pretty talented young blood and some old, old guard from Nike Exeter. You know, we had a guy, Jay Cole. We had Ray Tonkel. We had Dana Judas, the development guy, young guy, Dan Ellis, young guy, development guy. Um, really high, high powered guys, old mm-hmm. and young. Mm-hmm. Uh, guy Tony Heward. And we, we were tasked to rebuild adidas in the u.s so dana was like dude i know this designer he's amazing we should bring him in you know he and i were a team like that at at new balance Mm -hmm. and so dana called me and then they started recruiting me and they they put an offer on the table that was today's partner is shopdnashow.com are you tired of wearing low quality gear i completely understand i made a personal mission to go out and find higher quality stuff and give it to you guys at an affordable price. And not only because of that, I have to wear this stuff every day and I don't wanna be wearing cheap clothing all the time. So I wanna make sure that you guys know about it and are understanding that we have a lot of cool stuff coming out as well. Hit the link down below or pinned or wherever it may be. It's gonna be shopdnashow.com. There's new drops every single month. I'm excited to see you guys in the gear. And now let's go ahead and get back to the podcast. They started recruiting me and they, they, put an offer on the table that was double what I was making at New Balance. 
and you know it was in new jersey and all which was expensive living you know you, you find out later like mm, maybe i should have asked for a little bit more because it was so much more expensive to right. live down there versus living up in up in southern mass where i lived mm-hmm. and so i went to the new balance guys the the operations manager i'm like look you know dana left and he's He's trying to bring me to Adidas with him. I don't really want, you know, I, I don't know if I really want to go. I mean, I love it here. Right. I said, but look at the number they put in, in front of me. You know, what What should I do? I really didn't know, mm-hmm. you know, what was the right thing. And I asked my mom and dad, and they're like, oh, it's a lot of money, you know. And so at, at New Balance, I asked the operations manager, I said, what do you think? He goes, well, you know, the most we've got. For a designer, it's 20, 25K. And I'm like, what about two years from now? They're like, 25K. I said, <laughs> five years from now, 25K. That's it for a designer. And I'm like, you know, I, I really don't want to leave. You guys are leaving me no option. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to, uh, I can make double tomorrow. Right. And I said, I think I, I think I got to I gotta go. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're like, all right, you know, that's what you, you got to do what you got to do. So, I made the decision to leave. It was hard because I really loved it. It was a small, tight-knit family of people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it just showed what a tight-knit family it was after all these years. I still t- stay in touch with all those people because mm-hmm. they were like, they were family. You know, they were all older than me because I was a young kid. Um, half of them are dead, which is, you know, people like, oh, God, that's, it's, but it's the truth. They were all in their 40s. Uh, when I was there, other than the the younger guys like Dana, uh, who was two years older than me, um, yeah, so it was weird. So I left, and I went to Adidas in in New Jersey, and we tried to rebuild the brand, but the Germans had their thumb on us so hard. Mm-hmm. It was hard. They 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 wouldn't give us uh, permission to freely design. So shoes like the artillery did get rammed through, like. Because they, they look the other way. It's like, yeah, basket. Basket is the sport for the U.S. You can do the basket shoes. I'm mm-hmm. like, all right, great. Yeah, I'm going to do the best fucking basketball shoes you've ever yeah. seen in your life. And so, obviously, I'm going to ask you about moving, too. But I, I, it just made me think about the times I've sat in um, at Adidas, yeah. Pyrex samples and all the stuff that was happening back then. You know, 2010, 2013, time to, around then. But I remember sitting on the board talking to them. And I was like we're presenting all this stuff and I feel like they really don't care. Like they're, they're, they we're going to get nothing out of this meeting. Like, yeah, it's cool for me because I'm, you know, a young kid coming in, like helping represent and tell them, you know, what type of shoes we like, but like, they don't like those shoes over there. So they think it's supposed to be the same over here. Yeah. And it's not the same. Yeah. I mean, that's what we ran into at the time that the, the first launch of the torsion shoes came out. The colors were so whack for the U S they were maybe fine for Europe at that time. They were right. very influenced by, early memphis design uh weird miami pastels the shoes were polyurethane midsoles hard as a freaking rock <laughs> and we're like dude we you know there's a we we took we tried them out they're killing our legs you know mm-hmm. the the softest one was the cushion model and it was white with green with a little purple accent on it and that was the most bearable one the others were were terrible uh, for us, for the U.S. market, you know, because mm-hmm. we ran on concrete and blacktop. The Germans ran on trail and dirt, and right. it, it, it was completely different market, and the shoes weren't right for us. The concept was neat, you know, where the shoes twisted. It allowed your foot to move naturally from your heel to your foot, foot bone structure down into your forefoot, adapt and adjust. The, the thinking was sound, um, but the midsoles were hard as rocks, Mm-hmm. And and we're like it's it's not going to fly, and they didn't. You know, they made a small blip. Uh, people look back at it now because they reissued them as as streetwear, and and they're cool on the streetwear side. But at the time, they they were not good running shoes, <laughs> and so it was heartbreaking because like that was my passion was running shoes, and right. so I end up doing the takedown ones uh, just because out of EVA and and things, and those actually got some traction. And Adidas at that time was kind of a shit show. Mm-hmm. Um, it was hemorrhaging. Uh, they they wouldn't let us correct the market. Like I said, that one that one little pocket of products they allowed me to work on was the basketball shoes. Mm-hmm. Those shoes again became 
icons, the artillery would not die. The retailers were like, yeah, you know, we, you know, you got these new shoes, but give us another artillery, will you? Right, right, right. And, you know, I ended up being Kid Cudi's favorite. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was a weird time. I got in one Friday and, uh, they laid off half the office and I'm like, what is going on? You know? And then I came back the next Friday to work, and they laid off half of the half that was left. So we were down to a quarter staff. The building was freaking empty. So and at this time, this is like no email. No, there was this no, like there was no email. In. Faxes. You just walk in. Just they like gathered you into the cafeteria, and you're like, everybody at? <laughs> all right, uh, 3 o'clock, the layoffs start. You'll be handed a cardboard box. Oh it, just literally, it was very Germanic. Um, you'll... Four o'clock, you can walk around the building, see who else you work with. Good day, and off they go. <laughs> and I'm like, what is happening? I'd never been through anything like this before. And so here I was. I, I was at least, for affordability, living with my older brother. He worked at Bell Laboratories at the time, which wasn't too far away in, in uh, Edison. And I kept asking him, like, dude, I don't know what's going on. I've never seen anything like this before. You know, everybody's gone. <laughs> And so after that round, they gathered us all around, said, all right, you're looking at the core of what's left of Adidas U.S. We're probably going to shut it down in six months. Um, the rest of you can decide if you want to keep working for Adidas, you got to move to Herzo or um, ride it out and see what happens to the rest of what's left of Adidas U.S. So I'm like, yeah, this ain't looking so good. Um, and yeah, 23 years old. I didn't, I didn't want to move to Nuremberg. It's not exactly a hotbed of excitement. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the meantime, one of the guys I had worked at, at, with at New Balance had, had left. He was an old Nike Exeter guy, that guy Steve Burris. And he was trying to set up this first innovation team with Paul Fireman because Reebok didn't have anything like that before. And they were having this explosive growth. Mm -hmm. And... He was like, I, you know, it was almost like Dana, where like I know this guy, you know, he, right. he's a great designer. He'd be perfect for this innovation team we're kind of putting together. You know, he should be the lead design guy. So anyway, I, I finally, hey, hey Steve, uh, things are going to shit here. <laughs> I'd love to come up and talk to you. And so I went back up there. It was cool because it was it was Stoughton, so it wasn't too far from home. Mm -hmm. Um, so I could actually go back, live with my parents and then get another bump and pay. And I went there and interviewed and again, got the job within 48 hours. They didn't have this team yet. They were still trying to put it together. So they temporarily put me in, in basketball. I was working on like BB 4600s and 3600s mm -hmm. and 360 jams and things like that. And that was about two weeks. And then they moved me into cross training, um, and so I, I did, I did cross training, AXT, CXT, SXT models. And then they finally put together this team, you know, they announced this team like, yeah, there's going to be a one, one, uh, senior level design position, two mm -hmm. senior level development groups. Everybody's like, Oh, I'm going to get that design job. I'm going to get that design <laughs> job. Right. And I was, yeah, I had to sit there and be quiet. Like I already got it, but I'll just zip my lips for now. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, they, they announced the team, they brought me in, and uh, we immediately started working on, on the future of Pump, because Pump 1 Basketball was just about to launch. They were having some issues with it, so Paul Litchfield and I redesigned some of the pump mechanism, because it was, it was failing and, and, and some assembly, so we had to re-engineer some things, so that was kind of the first okay. thing. And so then they turned me loose, like... Fireman was like, you guys are the, my guys. You're the blue sky guys. You know, don't get bogged down in this regular stuff. Go show, you know, show me the future. Mm -hmm. Dream, blue sky. You got this is this is your job, mm -hmm. right? So we just got this great budget, and we kind of laid low and went into the darkness and disappeared down into the apparel team because nobody could find us down there. You know, we weren't in the mix. We were surrounded by all the apparel people. They didn't care who we were. We don't know what you, we don't care what you're doing. Right. You know, we're busy on apparel. It was perfect location. Mm -hmm. Nobody gave a shit what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So we could operate in like in the dark in black ops. Mm -hmm. So that's when we created like the next pump, Insta pump, 
pump without the shoe around it. You know, all these ideas kind of embodied in the fury of what we were working on. Vertical hexalite, tall hexalite, DMX, uh, what became ZigTech with this articulated running bottoms, injection EVA. We got to go freely explore other industries which was very unique at the time for mm -hmm. the for the business we went to aerospace mm. that's where we found the carbon fiber that became what was in the graphite road which then led you know i wanted the fury was what i wanted to make first and people were so scared of that shoe they're like don't cut the midsole all the way right. you know do it in phases we gotta we gotta get the consumer um comfortable with this this yeah. thing yeah. in in phases i'm like why compromise put this thing out there you know mm -hmm. it's so radical like exactly because it's so radical let's take a step so we did the graphite road and then we came out with the fury with the fully separate four foot and heel and we replaced all the space and support with this carbon fiber arch we were the first ones to use carbon fiber out. yeah wow, okay, and okay. so we did the the graphite road and we were trying to experiment with all kinds of things that were new at the time, like water jet cutting. Like, how do you cut this shit? Because, mm. I mean, it's, it's carbon fiber. It's, it's nearly impossible to right. cut. So we're, we found water jet cutters and things. And we went outside the industry even more into the medical devices because that's where we saw, like, blood pressure cuffs and things that were similar to what we were trying to do with uh, the pump yeah. and medical device shows you had fluid control and fluid management and direction with tubings and micro valves and all these crazy things that we could then make into and integrate into these new technologies of these shoes and one of the things that we did i still have the prototype at home we called it the black widow this was the first shoe that we showed Paul Fireman, where we took all these wild ideas of what could be for pump. We were at this industrial supply show, and mm -hmm. there was this company called ASF, and made, they made this microelectric pump, like that was really small. I mean, really small. Mm -hmm. And so I took it home and worked in my basement, which is a common theme these days for what I do, uh, with tinkering and fabricating and, and building and i took this thing and i had some of the medical device tubing and i made this bondo enclosure around this micro pump and i connected the tubing up into the upper from a pump one and then i cut away the midsole and made this carbon fiber leaf leaf spring and embedded it in the midsole and then i had this bellows almost like an air shock and I put that in between the carbon fiber leaf spring, like here. Mm -hmm. And then I, it was, it was a bitch to do because I had to make it airtight. I ran a Y connector to a valve, and then that went into this air shock unit. Okay. Right? And then I ran this pump off of a, a regular rectangular 9 volt battery. And you press the button, and this thing went, and it inflated the upper of the pump one and it also inflated this air shock and i had two different release valves one for the upper one for the bottom and i painted this thing all black and i was i was big into alice cooper and there's the song black widow mm -hmm. with vincent price does the voiceover which actually then michael jackson kind of tagged off of for thriller yeah, by yeah, using yeah. by using him as the same for the voiceover and so i i painted this thing black and I put a red tongue accent on it, and I wrote Black Widow in this hand script on it. <laughs> and we brought it in in a box, and we showed, went up to Paul Fireman's office, and like, this is the kind of thing we want to make. And we flipped open that box, and I pressed that button, and his eyes got like that big. He's like, holy crap, you guys did it. This is what we need, you know. <laughs> And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to crush the competition. We're gonna be the leaders in innovation. So that one really was the key that unlocked the door to like bigger budgets. Uh, we ended up getting our own building off campus, um, where we had the biomechanics guys were then integrated into our team, and we worked together with them in tandem, kind of the first of its kind in the in the industry. Mm -hmm. And we just created and created and created. We created so much that Reebok couldn't digest it. And you could see that, you know, 15, 20 years later, they were still in, dipping into that well for the technologies. Right. 
which was really cool, but it shows like how explosively creative we were at the time, you know, with those two guys kind of feeding me um, materials and, and, and tools and putting it together and we're brainstorming and then me going off and creating these things people had never seen before that blew their minds, you know, like we can never do that. We're like, why? Well, here it is. I just did it. You know, that was the thing. I was always up for the challenge. The, you know, what somebody said was impossible. It couldn't be done. I said, fuck it. Let's, let's do it. You know, what do we got to lose? We got the resources. Why not? You know, and then, then we did this really cool, that was a spinoff of the Black Widow eventually called Mm -hmm. Smart Pump. Whereas you, you know, we end up getting patents on all of this shit. I ended up with like 50 different utility patents, <laughs> um, which again goes back to my grandfather. Because right. my grandfather's whole life, he was always thinking of these ideas and inventions. And he submitted this patent for this Venetian blind concept. And I still have the patent model and all the paperwork from mm-hmm. when he did it in the 60s. Mm. I, I kept all that myself as inspiration. And, and I, I wanted to, to show him what. I could accomplish. Mm-hmm. So he never got his single patent and I end up with like 50 utility patents. My brother has like 10 or 20. Maybe he might even have more than me by now. I don't know. But we both went off with that drive to to um, honor our grandfather with mm-hmm. the, these ideas and these patents. And so we ended up creating this thing called Smart Pump that inflated itself as you walked. And then it had this micro control unit, like the size of a Zippo lighter that had a computer in it with these micro valves. And the micro valves were handmade. They were piezoelectric valves handmade on a workbench by Dean Kamen, who invented this kidney dialysis machine that was portable. But he also created the Segway. Uh, brilliant, mad scientist. And this thing was so cool. You, you walked in it, it inflated itself. These valves bled off or let more air in to adjust three different air units within within the pump shoe. Mm -hmm. And it had this micro brain that controlled it all that had algorithms built in that within one or two steps it knew what you were doing, whether you were cutting side to side, running forward or jumping. And it moved the air around within the shoe to add support and cushioning as you were doing these actions. What year was this? This was 1996. Okay. I mean, fucking crazy this when you think like of it. sounds like 2035. 1996, <laughs> we created this thing. So later, 99, I end up at Nike. So we were talking about different concepts and things, and, and I was describing this to them, and they're like, you're full of shit. Right. You guys never did. I said, it's real. Go look at the patents. You know, right. it's, it's patented. It just was never, it never came out. We made one pair of them. You put them on. It, the, the brain woke up and came on and knew that you were wearing them. And then it controlled all this thing. It was oh, wow. autonomous. It was autonomous. It was really cool. But the hardest thing were those valves at the time. Mm. The valves would burn out pretty quick within a couple hours. Gotcha. Um, the mi- MEMS and micro micro mechanisms didn't exist at that point. There was no real 3D printing like we know it now where this thing could have existed. Mm-hmm. It was way ahead of its time. I mean, even today, as I describe it, you're, you're like, holy shit, what year was this? Right. It sounds crazy, but we built this thing in 96. Yeah, and then I'm already thinking like, okay, how do you make this even affordable to the market and all the other things along with it? The creative side, yeah, that's great. And then it's like, that's the other part. You take your creativity and it's like, okay, I'm sure there's been plenty of times throughout your design process through all the companies where they're like, okay, we need to strip this down a little bit. Yeah, like, like oh, hold on there, kid, you know? It's difficult having to deal with that, you know, because here you were with this revolutionary shoe. And so when we were at Reebok, when we first started our group, we called it Advanced Concept Group or ACG. Mm-hmm. Nine months later, Nike comes out with the all conditions gear. So we're like, we had to change our name. That's so crazy. It became RAC for Reebok Advanced Concepts. Okay. But when we were still called ACG, people called us the Any Cost Group because we were creating these technologies and, and these these products that people had never seen before using these expensive materials. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, so that that smart pump shoe that 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 thing was going to retail for like. 250 bucks at that point and okay 96 97 that's a we, lot we were, oh yeah well you got to remember though the the pump one was 180 bucks when it came out i mean people forget that and you know that was what a uh, 91 that's like a 400 dollars shoe now i know isn't it crazy and 
it's it's kind of funny when you think about what we do and you think about inflation and pricing mm-hmm. uh, again you know you asked me financial uh, learnings and things think about what we do we're one of the few industries that's able to sell the latest version of something mm-hmm. but we're still able to sell our 65 mustang mm-hmm. right so mm-hmm. like your Air Force Ones and Jordan Ones and mm-hmm. Five Seven Fours, right? They haven't really gone up that much, you know. They're still under like you know, maybe for the Nikes, but like the New Balances, still under a hundred bucks. Right, right, right. Think about that. I mean, think about a Corvette mm-hmm. in 1990 mm-hmm. retail price, and you think about a Corvette now. Hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah. That's so we're crazy. still selling the 1990 Corvette for the, not far from the price we sold that at in 1990. Right. Right. And, you know, we still obviously have the latest and greatest running shoes and things, but there's still a ceiling of $200 pretty much. Right. Um, yeah. It's so interesting when you see a sneaker, uh, hit around that $200 price point, especially go over now. I don't know. I, I from the sneaker head standpoint, people are, well, is it worth this? Like, I'd rather get it at one ninety or whatever. Like, they're literally like so judgy on it from a ten dollar price point or twenty dollar difference on a sneaker, and it's crazy to see that. But besides that, I know we're talking about cars for a second. I know yeah. you're into cars, so talk about the love for cars, where it all started, just for a bit, because you know, like you said, you took a lot of inspiration from hospitals, airplanes, cars, all the different things, which I see a lot of designers do. Yeah. Uh, but what was kind of your pathway on that? Oof, you know, I loved machines. Uh, I loved fixing things because my older brother broke all my shit. <laughs> so that I think that's part of what made me a good designer. You know, it's, you think about it now. I'm I, you know, he broke all my toys and everything. But then I had to tinker with them and figure out how to put them back together and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it made me a good designer because I figured out how things were made, mm-hmm. and I saw a weak point, and like I could make that better if mm-hmm. I made it like that. Mm-hmm. And so that it affected how my brain worked. Now, my cousins, who lived a block away, they were older than me. Uh, my great uncle, he collected Fords. Mm-hmm. Uh, drove a 1923 Model T as his daily Jeez. car back in Massachusetts. Uh, kind of a nutbag. Crazy to be driving that back then, especially in Mass. I know, it's Because they were sold on the roads and everything still. Yeah, 23T, wooden rims. You know, I mean, there right. goes a crazy Uncle Tom. But they lived a block away, and he built a garage behind his house, bigger than the house. Mm. And it was full of Fords, Model mm. Ts, Model As, T-Birds, 55, 56, 57 Thunderbirds, uh, GT350 Hertz Mustangs, um, Ford V8 sedan, 32 Ford Rumble Seat Roadster, not hot rods. These were all okay. preserved street cars. Then he had, my, my cousin had a Buick GS Stage 1 mm-hmm. convertible, which, you know, was amazing with the big 455 and everything in it. And so I, when I was a little kid, we would go visit Uncle Tom and Aunt Mary and over there with the cars. And mm-hmm. so you're a little kid, you play in the cars. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'd pretend I was driving all these right, things. Right. And I would ask Uncle Tom, like, can you show me how to work on these things? Nah, I'm too busy. So it's kind of a, dis- you know, it was a, a, a joy and not joy at the same time because mm-hmm. I wanted to learn about them. But it was joyful because you got to play in all these cars. And they were funny because they bought them in the, the 70s during the gas crunch, mm-hmm. you know, when people in, they wanted like Toyota, you know, early Toyotas and Datsuns and things right. that were fuel efficient. So these muscle cars and these antique cars were not desirable right so they just started hoarding them right so i would go over there and play in them all the time you know and um that's kind of where the love for cars started with them i would always go over there. can i go play in the cars like yeah yeah what was the first car you got that was like i'm, I'm a car guy now like you know how you get your, your oh, like geez. first like pride and joy type car so it was very funny my you know the early 80s came around and gas was getting high again Mm -hmm. so honda came out with the first crx hf okay and it was that very first generation crx 
And my dad was commuting to Worcester from Taunton, where we lived. And it was a long commute. I mean, he had like 50-something miles one way mm. every day. And uh, so he saw this Honda come out called HF, you know, CRX, which people, you know, equate with the, the sportier version. But the very first one they came out with was HF for high fuel. And it got 50, 80, 84, I think it was. Mm -hmm. It got 50 miles to the gallon back then. Because okay. it was a little 1.5 liter, I think. Okay. And a standard. And so he's like, I'm going to get that because it's more fuel efficient. Mm -hmm. So he gave me his old Chevette, which had like 100,000 miles on it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't like driving the, the standard. So he gives me the brand new Honda and he takes the Chevette back. Mm. And, and, you know even though it was a fuel efficient car, the thing handled like a, a roller skate. You know, I would drive the crap out of that thing, drift in it and everything. And it's still got 50 miles per gallon. So that was kind of my first one. And then I kept that through college. And then when I went to work at, at New Balance, when I actually had my own income and didn't have to rely on the hand-me-down car, mm -hmm. um, I went and got a triple white, VW Cabriolet, you know, people mocked it for being the, the Gidget car. <laughs> but it was that year, the Wolfsburg edition one, it was triple white, white leather, and they had put all the GTI bits in it. Mm. So, I mean, it it went fast, it handled well, um, and it looked really cool, you mm -hmm. know. It was hard to keep clean because it was mm -hmm. all white. <laughs> but I loved that thing, you know. I would get it up on three wheels going around the exit <laughs> ramps and stuff from... Uh, 93 onto route 24 there in stoughton and it, it hauled ass you got it you got any uh pride and joy car now in the current time or like a little collection a little oh, something in the garage yeah i mean i i got my 65 vintage beetle that i road race it's a historic racing car Dope. um it's fast for a bug i got a um 1958 porsche 356 outlaw coupe mm. uh, i bought that when i moved to oregon almost 26 years ago people thought i was crazy like why are you buying that 50s car you know <laughs> right 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 and at the time it was 13.5 and you could get a neon with roll up windows in it for 13.5 with maybe a cassette player or a cd player at that point <laughs> that's a lot and i was like i could get this cool old porsche you know mm -hmm. and then uh i drove that thing year round studs everything and then it slowly started to keep going up in price and up in price and up in price. And now it's an absurd amount of money. And uh, I, I drive it when I can. I certainly wouldn't drive it as a daily driver anymore right. um, for to risk what Take it is. Take it out on the four sunny days we get. Yeah, yeah. No, sometimes, I'll, yeah, last year I drove it out in the snow, which was kind of fun. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful car. It's, it's just a beautiful, pure design and, and and it's a machine and it's mm -hmm. it's a 50s car that you can actually drive in modern traffic you know mm -hmm. it handles well it stops it starts it goes it's it's uh it's usable mm -hmm. in in a modern environment other than the fear of somebody hitting it right. for how valuable it's become and then um i got another i got another car that's gonna appear soon enough uh, -oh. uh that is a 1964 cheetah okay uh vintage racing car from the right. 60s and that was given to me by a friend that's dope yeah that's dope okay we'll probably see that on your instagram at some point uh next year next in the year? spring when it, aka a few months from now <laughs> yeah when it rears its head it's okay so one of, one of eight <laughs> that's fire yeah. okay um all right so we're talking about the reebok era yeah. This is where were you living at? You said you were back in Mass now. Yeah. Living I, out there. I was living back in Taunton. I bought. I ended up buying the house next door to my parents, and Fire. I lived there. Okay, so you're there now. You're you created some crazy stuff. Some stuff that still hasn't even hit the market yet. All these different things, and what gets you to move, and where do you go next? Well, it was funny. I in '92. I went and interviewed at Nike with Tinker and Mark Parker. Okay. And so was, you came to Portland? 
Yeah, they okay. secretly flew me out. Okay. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I had a quick question. Are you guys interested in taking your shoe game to another level, but you just don't know where to start? I built a full program just for somebody like you, the Six Figure Sneakerhead. It's an eight week program that takes you through all the steps that you need to know. We have a full community where you can engage with everybody else that's going through the same program as you. We have monthly live meetups where you can connect with me and other members on the inside, and we set goals for each other and hold each other accountable. Also, we give away a free pair of shoes every single month with different challenges. If this is something that's for you or you're looking to take your game to the next level or even flip your sneakers to turn that into real estate, this is the place where you need to be. I can help you with finding loans and remodeling properties and getting yourself on the right path to become a millionaire if that's something that you desire. If this sounds like something for you, hit the link down below in the description and get signed up today. This is more than just sneakers. I wanna see people grow and succeed in all aspects of life. Let's get back to the podcast. Interview went okay the trouble is those days you brought your portfolio and slides i had brought my own carousel with all my slides in it people don't know what that is anymore because they're not old enough <laughs> they had that when i was like in grade school yeah and so I, the, like I, th- I don't remember it by the time i got to middle school it wasn't a thing anymore but i definitely remember those for like because so I, I, I i was born in 91 yeah so. uh, yeah see so i brought the carousel with me with all my slides and uh, it was me and tinker and Tinker's like, do you have your work? I said, yeah, it's all in these slides. So it was kind of funny. You think of Nike being buttoned up and corporate and all that shit. They spent all day trying to find somebody to get me a slide projector so you could actually look at the slides. Because they told me, <laughs> the HR recruiter told me, bring your slides. So I brought slides. But they, the whole day they spent trying to find a freaking slide projector. So, <laughs> so you're just sitting there like, what is well, going t- on? Tinker had to hold him up in the window. He goes, boy, you can draw. you know. And he's like, just some good stuff, right? I'm like, oh, okay, thanks, right? So then I went home. And so I never said anything to anybody. Nobody knew I ever went there. So you're just there for the day? I went there for the day and came back. Okay. And it was a big secret. So didn't hear anything. So all of a sudden I get a letter in the mail, you know, the rejection letter. I still have it. Mm. I saved it. Uh, And I was like, you MFers, uh, that's it. I'm going to design stuff that you guys wish you had. Right. And part of that was the motivation because I had this sketch of the Fury. Mm -hmm. And I went and I built the Fury. I designed it and and built this thing that nobody had ever seen. Wow. I'm like, I'm going to design the shoe that Nike wish they had. They they missed out on me and they missed out on what I did. So Mm. out of it came the Fury. And so now this thing goes on to become this icon. And you see it at, you know, in, in the late 90s before i had actually gone to nike in the back of runner's world and slam magazine there's people looking for them Mm. they're like yeah you know we're looking for this nike model that nike model that nike model that nike model oh yeah and the fury the Mm. the one reebok shoe that was being sought after Mm. so i was like did my job right right it's it's being hailed and heralded and desired as much as the Nike shoes. That was my intent with this thing. And it was really cool because it ended up in the London Design Museum. It ended up in the Smithsonian. Uh, it ended up in all of these collections and, mm-hmm. and futuristic exhibits and things. So it was really cool. Um, Did you get to go experience it all and like see everything? Nope. Never got to go to <laughs> the, You know, they were too cheap to send me. Plus, I was busy creating the next. Yeah. You know, there was okay. always, I was creating the next. Yeah. That was a moment in time. This product dropped out. What's next? Mm -hmm. Continue. What's the next thing? And um, so anyway, Reebok was getting really annoying and very political. Fireman had kind of stepped away and uh, it was losing its soul. And, you know, when it came down to the projects, I would die on the sword for them because I knew they were the right thing. DMX was one of those. Mm -hmm. Uh, you get labeled as belligerent, difficult to work with because you believed in the product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people politically tried to assassinate me in the the company. Mm. And I fought them and I got just go see firemen and hit slap them back down. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it becomes fatiguing and overwhelming. And I'm just like, I'm out. Right. So earlier, a couple of years earlier, Kevin Crowley from Fila had been calling me like, I want you to come design with me. I see your work you've done. You know, I'll give you I'll double what you're getting paid. You know, it always seemed to be a common theme. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like, I'm not mad at this. <laughs> so he was working out of his garage. And I'm like, dude, I'm going from this like state of the art facility in, in Stoughton to like 
your garage? Right. I don't know, dude. It's kind of risky. And where were they know? located? He was working out of his house in Newburyport, Mass. Oh, okay. So this is all just like popping up at the same area. Yeah, I mean, okay. New England, so there were kind of two pockets, New England and then out out here. Mm-hmm. And and it was because of Nike and Columbia and Danner was all here. Mm-hmm. And so at that point in time at Reebok, Fila had actually started to make a little headway into things. And so I called up Kevin. I'm like, dude, I'm ready. I said, I've had it with this place. Mm-hmm. And he's like, all right, let's meet up. So we met up and he put out this number and I'm like, sounds good to me. And uh, so I went to go work at Fila and there I was kind of this blue sky spec ops. And I, it's, it seems to be my, my MO. Right. <laughs> it's like go blue sky, create the future of what these companies want. So I did all this dreaming at Fila and, very little, of it, very little of it came out. I mean, I was working on their Future 2A, and that then became the platform that was going to go into the Grant Hill. So I got to work on Grant Hill and the 2A and that, and that's why that one kind of okay. um, reared its head. But then they picked a different design, and uh, then Fila was it was like Adidas Part 2. I was reliving the Groundhog Day where Fila wasn't doing so good. They had sold us a bill of goods on the health of the company. Mm. They were slashing the team in Portland. They were slashing the team in Newburyport. And um, finally, they said they were going to close down. So that's how I got out to Oregon. Fila had an office here, too? Yeah, on, on the waterfront in the Ben Franklin building. So that's yeah, that's that's who moved me here. Really? Yeah. Was this, so they, when 90, they, they opened the early 90s? 97. Oh, late 90s. Yeah, so they really? wanted to steal Nike people. So they opened an office here. Oh. And those guys, I was coming out here every month. And they're like, you might as well just move here. Right. So that's what I ended up doing. I, I moved here in, in uh, 97. For, what was it like? How was your impression of the first move into Portland? It's I li- obviously way different now. But. I liked it then. Yeah, it was very clean. It reminded me of Tokyo. You know, they it was were cool. cleaning the streets every night. The downtown was vibrant. Uh, there were lots of great restaurants. Parking was easy. Mm-hmm. It was a lot cheaper living here, yep. you know. Um, so I, I, I loved it. So it was an easy it was an easy thing to come out. And they paid, you know, they paid all the moving expenses and everything for it, which was cool. Yeah, around like 2007, 2010, I would say was like the time where it definitely started to transition yeah, it's more into weirdness and changing sketchy. and everything. More traffic, more sketchy, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could leave my house and be downtown in five minutes for a, a, a meal, you know? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so that's who moved me out here. Then they were talking about shutting down the office, and it was like Adidas Part 2. We're like, all right, we're going to close the office. You can either move to Biella in Italy, where the headquarters is, or move back to Massachusetts, where you started. And I'm like, dude, I've only been here for two and a half years. I'm not turning around and moving everything back. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I... Got into Nike. Mm. So Kilgore was going to bring me into the Ape, what was called Ape, for advanced product engineering. And okay. that, that team got blown up and became the kitchen. And tell, uh, Oh, yeah. Tell everybody what the kitchen is because not everybody knows what the So it's funny. They called it the ki- kitchen. It was kind of Tinker's little innovation team. But it was because there was this blank space left in Mia Ham, kind of behind the actual cafeteria and kitchen so that's why they called it the kitchen Mm -hmm. but you know the double entendre was like we're cooking up the future in here Mm -hmm. so it was kind of neat so that's that's where i was originally destined to go then they had a hiring freeze then they blew up kilgore's team then they had continued the hiring freeze so i had to go six months and stall out fila like yeah i gotta get my house painted i gotta get the yard work done before i can put the house on the market yeah yeah, i'm working on it i'm working Mm. on it so me and my developer were working out of my house Mm. And so then the the door cracked open for a moment. There was one headcount in all of design, and it was for Nike ID, which mm. didn't even exist yet. Wow. Okay. So, so this is like, what, 98? 90, 90, 98, 99. 99. So, okay. Uh, Michael Donahue pulls me in. Here's your chance. I'm hiring you. I'm embedding you in running. You're going to be paid by this Nike ID team, even though it doesn't exist. Right. right? They have a budget for a headcount for design. So that's how I got in. So mm. I kind of stayed in running. I was being paid for by what would then become Nike ID for my headcount. And then uh, then I got to work on all the innovation and stuff in, in running and the main line as well, all the Bowerman product. Because, again, going back to my roots, so that purity of design and being a runner 
it just seemed natural to go work on all the the Bowerman namesake products, so like Pegasus structure. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I worked with the Japan guys, and that's where things like the Spectrum and the Spiriton and those shoes, kind of kind of came about. And the Ekiden. Yeah. And uh, so I was passionate about it, and, and the Japanese and I got along really well because we're both fanatics on those those last little incremental details to make things always make things better, not different, but better. Mm-hmm. And that became this this OCD behavior that the Japanese and I have in common. When they go into something, they go deep. Mm-hmm. And we were like the perfect match for that. Right. Attention to detail. Yeah, so I, I did a lot of the J- Japanese product for running, helping them revive Nike Japan mm-hmm. on the running business. And then I, I, because of the technologies, I worked on track and field and did a lot of the lead spikes so it was really cool it was a great time did the max 2009 did the air units it was kind of the first time a designer had done the air units yeah uh so i did what became the you know the the next model after the 360 because the 360 was really stiff and hard and we re-engineered it to create what became the max 2009 of the fully uncaged Mm -hmm. max and then from there, you know, I can't help myself, so I was dreaming of the future. I did the next three steps on what the Air Max bottom unit should look like, and out of that came the Vapor Max. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they always told you, like, you shouldn't be in a category for more than a year and a half. I was in running for nine years because I loved it, mm-hmm. but I was the last person left in the category. Mm-hmm. And I'm yeah. like, all right, what's well, going on? They're like, well, if you want to move up, you got to move out. And I'm like, but I love running. It's what I do well for the brand. They're like, you got to move out if you want to move up. So I moved over to kids because I was I had a baby on the way, and so I became the co-manager of kids with Bill Cass. He did boys, I did girls and toddler. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, what what is it? kids like? Kids running, kids everything. Like, just all kids footwear. Yeah, all kids footwear. And okay. so because of my passion for the history. And my knowledge of the past, one of the first things I got to do there was take all the the retro styles and re-engineer them and make them look like the adults again because they had gotten so warped through costing and yeah, evolutions. Like ruining the and yeah, everything. they didn't look right anymore. So I went through and revamped every one of the the retro styles to look more like the adults. So they were a real takedown instead. And what years were this? Oh, God, this was 2000... Like four or something like that? No, like 2007 Seven? to 2009. Okay, because I was thinking, I'm like, that's what I was asking. I don't know if you started thinking, because I do, that's what I'm asking, because I was in high school 2006, 2007, something like that. I was a freshman around that time. And I, that's why I said that, because I remember seeing that, because a lot of people of our age was like transition from youth size to adult size, depending yeah. on grade school, middle school, high school, all that stuff, so... I remember seeing the the fix of the shoes, yeah. and then especially on the Jordans, it was terrible. I remember they had those chunky midsoles, and there was yeah, they no, just didn't look right no anymore. Flavor to them. You know? I was like, "What's going on?" And uh, so that was, I made that a personal goal to revamp these things and make them an authentic full family. So it was really cool. It was a cool opportunity. That's I dope. did I did this crib shoe. It was one of my favorites, the crib Mary Jane for babies baby girls in particular it was beautiful i did the sunray adjust which ended up you know most of those shoes would have gotten redesigned within two years it was in the line for seven years eight Mm -hmm. years untouched Mm -hmm. Uh, so again i I did my job i created these things that lived way beyond the expectation of what they were meant for Mm -hmm. but moving over to kids i was then vulnerable and 2009 2010 they had the big layoffs in the economic downturn and then I had you know again being caring about the product first and my career second I had made a few enemies there and got got uh basically got set up and got fired in in 2010 so okay after doing one of the biggest max shoots that's that's great I'm gonna ask you the other question after now because I was gonna ask you something else but yeah how do you go about like you said you are a disruptor yeah, you are a person that is true to your colors. You kind of you see what you get. This is what you get. How do you go about that and then navigating in a professional workspace um, without kissing everybody's ass or whatever, and just finding the common ground to say, "Hey, I want to be successful in this space. I don't want to get kicked out. I want to be able to thrive and create these things." Because it's hard for people to uh, navigate relationships and manage themselves within businesses or their own businesses. 
with other businesses? Mm, it's hard. I mean, I possibly learned 80% of it since I, I got fired from the job I thought I was going to have for the rest of my life and mm-hmm. retire from with the gold watch. But those days are over for everybody there mm-hmm. since the last six or seven years. I mean, they've shit canned legends and it makes no sense it's whatsoever. Crazy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've always stayed true to my mission, the product, the, the brand. And fuck it all, fuck the money, you know. I, I like I said, I, I I haven't made as much money as I should have over the years compared to other people who sucked it up, who played the game. But I don't play games. I don't play politics. Mm-hmm. I play product. I play excellence. And I don't mm-hmm. care who gets in the way. I'm gonna make the best freaking product possible. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've always stood for. And at the end of the day, I go to sleep at night comfortably knowing that I did the right thing because I can look back through my 38 years history. Every company I've been at, I did the right thing. And every company I've been at still sells those products that I worked on because I did the right thing. Um, so to me, the the financial goal was never as important as the product goal, the end in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and those those products have stood the test of time. I did the right thing. And I feel comfortable with that, uh, that I did the right thing because they'll outlast me. The people who are the obstacles or the people who are monetary driven, they're, sure. they'll be forgotten short termers. Um, but my product, they were they were like my children. They've grown up and they, you know, I want to pat them on the head like, oh, you've done really well for yourself. Mm-hmm. Good job, you know. And I, I go, good job. You yeah. raised some, you raised some good kids there. I like that. You know, uh, and that's the way I look at it. They'll outlive me. Mm-hmm. That's what's cool. So anyway. I like that. No, I like that. Philosophical <laughs> jumbo. <laughs> no, it's it's true though because it's the same thing for like being a YouTube TikToker or Instagrammer or social media or any th- other business or whatever. Like, are you chasing the views? Are you chasing the money? Are you what are you chasing? Are you chasing yeah. the impact? Like for me, I can easily go to that. Like, okay, am I gonna chase the views? I know this video will get ten million views. I know this video will get a million views. But is this along my lines of what I really want to create, what yeah. I stand by, what I believe in, or am I doing it just for the wrong reasons? And then that's when you got to check yourself and say, hey, what am I here for? I'm here for the impact of my audience. I want to help them. I want to teach them. I want to, you know, I want to be able to do the same thing, see other people grow in different levels as well. So I feel you on that. Like sometimes it do be hard to <laughs> bite that bullet, but yeah. it's like you got to do it. I don't know. I just never, never compromised, you know. I just can't be bothered with that. I, don't, I, I can't drag myself down to somebody else's level of mediocrity when I can live superiority and give all. I, when I go to a company, I give it my all. Whether they want it or not, they're getting it because right. that's, why, that's why they hired me. Right. I don't want to go there and be dumbed down or be asked to you know, live at somebody else's weak level mm-hmm. just to make them feel good. You, you know, Don't wallow in mediocrity. It's, step it up to my game right design things that i see holy shit i wish i designed that you know because there, there's there's very few products that i've seen that made me feel that way you know bruce kilgore did it with the sock racer mm-hmm. when i was at new balance that thing came out and i was like what is that right that's what i want to be making mm-hmm. something like that you know not exactly that shoe but something that disruptive and different right it makes res- you feel that it resets the whole market yeah and, you know, I know Kilgore always thought I was blowing smoke up his ass when I told him that. But I'm like, dude, it was pivotal. It was life-changing when that shoe came out. That's what I wanted to make. And it, what made me want to work at Nike. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, you know, in first five years were magic like that. Then the second five years were just like a disappointment because <laughs> it became politics. And right. Bullshit and the fakers and the takers instead of the doers and the, the achievers. Mm-hmm. Uh, compromise, mediocrity. I just, I just can't live in that environment. That's why I love working with Yay. It's this. We're, we're cut from the same cloth. We're, we're, we, we ride together. We're the yin and the yang for each other. Mm-hmm. People look looked at us as like the Tinker and Jordan of today because it was, you know, it wasn't so much basketball. It was lifestyle, and we're we were creating the things that were disrupting the industry. We're giving it us, giving it our all. Mm-hmm. Same he does with the music. It's why the albums take so long. It's, you want to give it your all. You don't want to come out with something half-assed. And it's the same way with the product that we create, whether it's the apparel, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's the shoes, whether it's the architecture. It's like it's got to be, it's got to be giving it us our 
all. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. I give 110% for everywhere I've been at, whether they want it or not. That's what they signed up for from me. Mm -hmm. And uh, with him, it's, we've been the perfect complement for each other because he's creatively insatiable and I'm creatively explosive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's been, you know, you, you look up, uh, a friend of mine had me look up horoscopes and the uh, profiles of a Gemini and a Sagittarius, which I am, and okay. we're the ultimate pairing. Okay. Because the Gemini wants to go anywhere and everywhere, and the Sagittarius is the enabler who's like, let's go, I'll ride with you. Mm -hmm. And seeing that was uh, like mind-bending because it's like it was it was us mm -hmm. you know empowering each other like he says let's go do this i'm like yeah let's go do it mm -hmm. and we do it together and out of it comes this magic have you uh read the or listened to the book rocket fuel uh -uh. okay so it's funny because i just went through it a couple weeks ago and it talks about like successful companies and how, like you said, the tinker to the Jordan or whatever, so-and-so, McDonald's and his partner, like, you always have the person who's the face and then you have the other person. So you have essentially, like, the visionary and the operator, yeah. right? The visionary operator. So, but I see both of you guys kind of like... We blur. A mix of that. Yeah. And you've been able to create success with that. How do you think it is? Not even, I don't even know. I wouldn't say, I don't know if it's like his personality or whatever, but more of just like his workflow um, for other people that have that kind of blur because I'm in that same position right now with like my assistant and my people on my team. Uh, we're both kind of visionary. We're both operators. We're trying to figure out how to become more, you know, just better with our business. I think part of it is, you know, my track record and his deep respect for it. You know, mm -hmm. he trusts me. I'm one of the few people he actually trusts. He asks opinions and ideas and thoughts on things and mm -hmm. we bounce them off each other nonstop. Um, and I, th I think that's it is respect. There's not a lot of people he respects like that. And I delivered. You know, you look at the styles I did for him and they freaking broke the rules. They broke the ground. We mm -hmm. did it together. There were other people who tried to drag us back and, and compromise us. And we're like, no, we're not doing it. And again, the proof is in the results. Look at the styles that we did. They've become these instant icons and classics. Uh, you can't deny it. Mm -hmm. And he sees it, acknowledges it, and, and uh, rewards it. And we, we work together that way. You know, there's, there's still there's the excellence that he represents and the excellence that I represent. And then the meeting in the middle and how we operate together, which mm -hmm. is the magic. It's hard to describe. So how do you go about your new Blue Sky creative process in current time working with you? Uh, you know, he bounces an image off me or some thoughts and ideas, and I riff then I send it back to him, he riffs it back, and we, we send it back and forth. It's like, it's very much like music. So you kind of work from home? Uh, I work from wherever. Okay. You know? I mean, right now it's a good time to work from home while he's in Europe, although I did go over there for a week with him in Europe to kind of catch vibes, and I might have to, I might, I might, I'm feeling like I might need to go over again soon mm -hmm. to connect, reconnect with him, although we're doing pretty good via text at this point. Mm -hmm. Then we, you know, we have a phone call every now and then when it, we think it's needed. Um, but I think at this point, it just flows between us naturally. I mm -hmm. kind of sense and know what he wants. I feel that. So, okay. I was thinking about it too, because I also, for people that don't know, we, we kind of, we have, we officially met a couple years ago yeah. at a sneaker event. And then I reached out and I was like, hey, you want to get on a podcast? And that's how we came about this. But I was thinking about it before that because I'm always like, okay, how is somebody in the industry for this long? Obviously, like, I haven't been in it as long as you. But I'm like, because I'm around the same type of people, how have we not met before? And I started thinking about it. Did you go to All-Star Weekend in L.A.? What was that, 2018? I did not. You did not? No. But at the no. time, you were disappointed the position? 2016, so I joined him, but I had to keep it quiet. And it was low-key. Yeah. It was and it was officially announced when? Probably, like, he... You know, I signed so many NDAs that I couldn't talk about what I was doing. And Adidas was very strict on like, you can't say anything. You can't do this. I you can't be there. And he, so it's probably about 2018. He kind of said, all right, you're the face. Because I because All-Star Weekend is always in February. Yeah. And I remember going and I'm like. I, I probably don't... left just the day before because I would go down there. and Because then... you have brought, I think you have brought some samples out there. Probably. Of what the Yeezys were going to look like. Yeah. And. 
I remember being there because I went to the uh, Adidas event and I'm like I'm trying to think if I had met you at that or something because I, that, that's the when 707 I, space. Yeah. 747 space. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The space that they had there and yeah. I had went in, but they were like, because I think he was there and had just left or something. And I was there with some other people that were like, used to work at Nike, went back and forth. You know, everybody's tied into each other. Yeah. So I went in and then they were telling me about it. And then that's when I had first like heard of you. And they were talking about the designs and everybody was like, same thing. Oh, this stuff is going to be bad. All the different stuff. Because you hear it and everybody's like, I don't know what it is. Like all these weird designs and all these crazy things. But that's why I was trying to connect in my head. I'm like, did we meet at that or not? Like, I don't know. That's the beauty of being me, you know. I get to operate in the background. Yeah. Um, you know, he 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 loves that because I'm not there for the fame. I'm not there to tag along behind him. You know, uh, I'm there to create with him, and that's what mattered to me more than anything. Mm-hmm. Again, even more than the money, it's like, let's create magic, and that's what I love. I love the product. I love, you know, I'm a, I'm a pleaser naturally, and I right. want to make him happy and come out with great product and Mm -hmm. that's what we do um and i just it's it's been the best time of my career because i get to dream in blue sky and there's no corporate baggage with it it's me and him what do you think i like it i don't great let's go Mm -hmm. and that's so liberating and refreshing to me it's priceless well the thing that we have going for us that other companies don't is there's no branding Mm -hmm. and we create each style is an individual standalone style. It doesn't have to be a takedown or connect to the other. Right. Um, but that's the thing that he says I add to it is I add the easy DNA to it. I'm the strand that connects it all. Right. I'm his eyes and hands. And you don't need a logo to know. You don't need a logo. We're creating these art pieces. But there's definitely a vibe and a flavor and a DNA to it that you immediately see it and like that's a easy. Mm-hmm. It's different as some of the styles that we've done because of the way he works on it and the way I help him, you see it, you immediately know it's a Yeezy, mm-hmm. right? I mean, mm-hmm. 500 looks nothing like a 700, looks right. nothing like a 350, looks nothing like a 450. Um, they stand alone, mm-hmm. but you immediately know that's the new Yeezy when you see it right. because that's what we deliver. Mm-hmm. And that's what's cool. We create accessible art that's usable, you know, you can only hang a Da Vinci on the wall, um, but our stuff you can use or you can collect and display it like an art piece, right. you know, and they, they appreciate over time, which is really cool. And I think that's the way you have to view it. I mean, it's the way it's the way I kind of look at it. Mm-hmm. So I feel that. OK, so what would you say were some of your uh, favorite pieces that you've created, you know, shoes that you've created over the years that not just socially or successful mm-hmm. but the one that you're like i feel so good about this this one was a success to me like because you know sometimes you got those projects that stand out in your eyes and it's like for me i can make a banger video it gets two thousand views and i'm like oh yeah i have another one get a million views and i'm like i don't even like that video i don't know you know dmx was a big one the original dmx walking because mm-hmm. at the time like i said we were slandered as any cost group within Reebok and so we quietly went underground and created this technology that was going to be a buck 25 a pair that was going to go into 65 to 75 dollar walking shoes mm-hmm. right and and walking was kind of wavering in its popularity at the time and we came out with this thing that felt so damn good for a $65 shoe technology that was groundbreaking. And the first year we sold 14 million pairs mm-hmm. of those damn DMX walking shoes. It was crazy. <laughs> and we made all the parts in Worcester, which was even cooler. Right. You know, um, made in the U.S. You know, the technology was made in the USA. Massive volume. And it made people's lives better. Mm-hmm. It, we made a comfortable walking shoe, which didn't exist at the time. And, mm-hmm. and out of that spawned the DMX running pieces and all of that, and all of Reebok's DMX technology from that single component. That's crazy. Um, that's, that, that's one I have pride in. Um, and that little baby girl's Mary Jane is still one of my favorites. You know, it was so... It was the antithesis of what I was known for, of mm-hmm. like this high performance track and field Japanese technology. 
Um, it had technology in it. It had my slant added to it, but it mm. was a beautiful, delicate little shoe because I used a flower motif on it and a repeat in the perforations and the tread, uh, even in the strap and the heel counter. It, it was just beautifully resolved. And I, I will say that's one of the things that the products that I've been involved in are resolved. No matter what way you turn it around, it looks good from every angle. And I think part of that goes back to learning my craft by hand, hanging out with the pattern makers at New Balance, seeing them interpret my drawing for the good or for the bad. And when they did it for the bad, I would then have to go in when it transitioned from two dimensions to three dimensions mm -hmm. to resolve it and get it to what I saw in my head and translate it to them so that in three dimensions it comes out right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, I think that's a difference where no matter where you turn it, it looks balanced, it's resolved from any angle. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things as I look back retrospectively on the designs that I've done that I add to it. And it just comes natural now. When it's done, it looks right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's just it's part of my brain function right, right now when I design like yeah i mean you've been taking so many repetitions of all this stuff over the years is i could understand why you could just feel it and be like this is yeah the that's life. the thing you feel the form when you're drawing it you're feeling the form and yeah. the shape as your hand moves you know that's why i didn't like digital as much because you, you click drag click drag click drag click drag this is with a pen and pencil it's you're, you're feeling the form and the curve and you're getting it just right the way your hand moves and mm -hmm. i'll redraw the same line a hundred times till i get it the way i want it mm -hmm. and you know that was the thing for me with with yay i transitioned finally from paper to pure digital working on an ipad because with the apple pencil i think was that revolution with yeah. sketchbook pro mm -hmm. uh, going back to the the wacom tablet as the first dabble in it but i still couldn't carry that with me um the big ipad with the apple pencil that was the revolution that got me away from paper because mm -hmm. i could actually just hit the back arrow and take away a line and then redraw it again and hit the back arrow and redraw it again until i got it to where i was happy with it mm -hmm. you know it could be two times it could be 200 times i've drawn that same line but it allows me to do that rather than start the whole sketch over again and redraw it to get that one line right so you just be at the house or somewhere anywhere on the line airport You'd be planes. Like, i gotta take a break I write to the same line, like yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've done it on planes, same line, twenty-five times, and like that's it. Let's end it with the fire uh, round of questions, real quick. What okay. is the greatest sneaker of all time? Oh, you know, to me, it's that sock racer that Kilgore did. Okay, it was it changed the industry. I like that. I like that. And then, what is your uh, prized possession shoe that you have in your collection? Oh. Like if you know, everything was gone, I could only use, I could only keep one. It was those super comps, but I sold them. But I would say it was <laughs> replaced by my original first prototypes of the Pump Fury. Okay. Um, I think that's it with the yellow blown rubber sole that they actually reissued on the anniversary that came in the whole kit. They did the, the prototype series. Yeah. Uh, these are questions that everybody asks me all the time, so I'll re-ask them to everybody that's uh -huh. on the show. Uh, other question is, how many pairs of shoes do you have in your collection? Oh, geez. You know, I narrowed it down probably to about 200. At one okay. point, I had about 500. But, it's, you know, they take up space. It's a lot. And then finally, I just started to purge. I, like, I wanted a motorcycle, so I sold off a bunch of my Nikes to buy a motorcycle. I feel that. Yeah. You still be riding? Yeah. Yep, yeah, I got it. Dope, dope. And then uh, how long do you think you're gonna be designing do you think you're gonna go you know 10 15 20 more years what's, what's it looking like whatever i can you know i, I always describe myself and yay we're creative sharks mm -hmm. i don't know if you know the but like if a shark stops swimming it dies right and that's kind of the way i view view creation there's definitely times where i'd like to say fuck this and go off and race my cars into eternity but i don't know if i could live that way every day i mean i like creating i like mm -hmm. solving problems you see something like i can make that better it was never about making it different. It was always about making it better. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's just inherent in me. So I don't know. I don't, I, you know, you know, it's like, can I afford to retire? Uh, this year has been bad. I've been uh, watching my, my 401k plummet. So like, I, maybe I can't retire yet. <laughs> I don't know. You know, 2023 20, has been misery for me. 
Yeah, right. It's uh, man, economy. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, beyond the economy, right. there's been a lot of yeah. a lot of stuff that's hit me hard in in this year that I can't wait for it to be over. Well, I hope that you're able to get through it. Uh, yeah you know mentally financially physically everything whatever's going on yeah i mean it's hard as creatives you know yeah. we're introverts inherently and we we take everything internally deeply and it hits harder it can swing into deep depression mode at times yeah. i'll tell you you know but sometimes out of that drives the 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 motivation to mm -hmm. to leap out of it and out of it comes the new designs i don't know or you can wallow in it for a while i know it's a tough time right now yeah so um, well, I want to give you your flowers for everything that you've done. You've had an amazing career. I'm excited to see what you continue to create as well. Um, and I love, you know, learning from other people and hearing more about your story. It was a pleasure as always. And if you could just uh, tell the people where they could follow you and give a final message to your young self or somebody out there listening, that's whether they're going through something or what they would have a little life nugget for them. Yeah, I mean, you can find me on Instagram just as Stephen with a V, Stephen Smith, or, uh, you know, LinkedIn uh, on a professional level. Those are kind of the two main two main social media things I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. um, be ready for cars and uh, not just all sneaker content, but lots of cars um, and things that interest me. I try to, you know, people are like, I'll put more sneakers. But, you know, what I try to display on there is things that interest me that then influence what become the designs, the sneakers, the cars, right. the, the the apparel, furniture, whatever. Whatever I'm creating, I like to give them glimpses into the, the nuggets, the Easter eggs of where things came from, the origins of it, and how they formulated uh, advice, you know, build the future you always wanted. That's what Ye and I talked about. We were disappointed both growing up in different eras of science fiction and the dream of the future, mm -hmm. whether it's optimistic or pessimist, pessimistic, we were, we feel like we were let down on the future we were promised. Mm -hmm. So we just said, fuck it, let's build the future that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's one of those common things we have together. So we build the future that we want and everybody else can enjoy it if, if they so choose. So do that. Stay true to yourself. You know, if you want to go make money, fine. Suck it up, make the money. I mean, I stay true to myself and my designs and build the future that I always wanted. I like that. I appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for popping in. We had another good episode. We signed out. Oh, yeah. Hit that subscribe button and the download button and all the other things. I forget to say that at the end every time. See you at all the complex cons and sneaker cons with our man here. Yes, sir. All right.